Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, welcome to the lecture series of NPTEL on medical pharmacology. Today I shall be discussing an area which is otherwise very important and that is drug therapy in cancer. Cancer we all know it is truly speaking it is not a single disease, it is a problem, health problem and depending on the different tissues and organs of our system, we have people suffer from different types of cancer. And it is a otherwise a dreaded disease, particularly in reference to the sufferings and shortening of life. Most of the cancers are fatal and that is the reason why it is of great concern. Of course, in the last few decades there has been lot of advances in the treatment of cancer and we will today discuss the role of drugs in the treatment of cancer. The, when drugs are used for treating cancer or more correctly the chemical drugs, it is called cancer chemotherapy. We will discuss today the principles and practice of cancer chemotherapy. In fact, this lecture is we have thought of dividing into two sub lectures. The first part we will discuss about the principles of cancer chemotherapy and in the second part we will be discussing relating to the practice whereby we will have some discussion on the different drugs that are used separately. So, the first about the principles of cancer chemotherapy. Before talking to the principles of chemotherapy, let us try to understand how cancer occurs or how cancer happens. Now, we all have heard of cancer, but at the same time there are other terms also which are used to refer to the same health problem like malignant tumor or malignant neoplasm or simply malignancy. Now, all these terms are used to refer to the same health problem and that is the cancer or cancerous tumors. What happens there? What happens really in malignancy? Now, basically the development of cancer is characterized by some very specific features or specific attributes. The first is uncontrolled or rapid cell division. When you talk of rapid, we actually mean the cell division occurring in a logarithmic scale. So, it is very fast, very rapid and it is uncontrolled. When you say uncontrolled, we actually mean normally otherwise the cells as they divide that is, un, that is well regulated and well controlled. No cell is allowed to keep on dividing innumerable times. So, after some cycles of division, they, the division will be arrested. Now, in cancer that arrest, physiological arrest is lost, it becomes uncontrolled replication or uncontrolled proliferation. Now, as a result of this uncontrolled rapid proliferation, cell proliferation, the cells that are produced, they are, they are not different from the normal cells, they are not normal. In the sense, they are de-differentiated, they cannot be differentiated and they do not function normally. As the cells are growing fast, it is, big, it is getting bigger and bigger swelling 
So, it invades the local area also, invasion of the surrounding tissue that is the power of local invasion. Besides the tumor cancer tumor or cancerous tumor or malignant tumor also has the potential to spread to a distant organ and that is called metastasis, metastasis or distant spread. The spread could be either through blood blood circulation whereby it is called hematogenous spread or it could be lymphatic by lymph channels. In fact, the cancer cells they travel, they traverse, they move to distant side either through flowing blood or through lymph and it goes to other organ where it again proliferate and the functioning of that organ is affected. So, that is called metastasis and finally, in cancer, the genes are damaged and the genes that otherwise control the cell growth, they are damaged. We will talk about the genes which are responsible for development of cancer. Now, let us recollect normal cells have two types of genes relating to cancer development. One is called a proto-oncogene, the term onco means cancer, oncogene and proto-oncogene. So, one type of genes are proto-oncogenes, the other type of genes are anti-oncogenes. The very name suggests proto-oncogenes, they control cell division, apoptosis that is program cell death and differentiation. There are different epigenetic factors which can induce the conversion of the proto-oncogenes to oncogenes. So, the proto-oncogenes are converted to oncogenes under the influence of some facilitating factors or epigenetic factors. Now, these oncogenes they actually will catalyze the malignant changes in the cell. That means, while the proto-oncogenes will be controlling the cell division, apoptosis which is programmed cell death and differentiation as the proto-oncogenes are converted to oncogenes, these properties of proto-oncogenes are no longer there, rather oncogene will be catalyzing malignant changes. On the other hand, the anti-oncogenes which are practically speaking the other way of calling it is tumor suppressor genes. So, more commonly they are known as tumor suppressor genes as the very name suggests they are supposed to suppress formation of tumor or cancer. They normally suppress malignant changes and if they are mutated, if they are modified, changed, mutated, they would lose their suppressor property as a result of which the carcinogenesis is promoted. So, by these two mechanisms conversion of proto-oncogenes to oncogenes and also by mutation of the tumor suppressor genes carcinogenesis or malignancy can develop. Inactivation of oncogenes and development of inactivation of anti-oncogenes and development of oncogenes will finally confer autonomy of growth on the cells. So, the cells is no longer under the influence of these two factors, two genes, two groups of genes, proto-oncogenes and anti-oncogenes. Okay. So, it is the oncogene that will be driving as a result of which and the, the there will be formation of development of cancer. Carcinogenesis is otherwise a very complex multifactorial and multi-stage process. This is important to understand in order to understand how the different anti-cancer drugs work. We have spoken about the participation of the two broad types of genes that is oncogenes and anti-oncogenes, proto-oncogenes and anti-oncogenes. Now, these gene mutations can be either inherited or can be acquired. Basically, there is gene mutation that occurs as a 
which act as a precursor to cancer development. The acquired gene mutation occur by the different triggers or epigenetic factors that we have mentioned the different chemicals, viruses and irradiation. On the other hand, one can also inherit a mutated gene from the parents. In either case, this gene mutation will lead to altered gene expression. That means, the proto-oncogenes to oncogene conversion will be affected or rather it can be promoted and expression of anti-oncogenes or tumor, tumor suppressor genes will be decreased. And when this happens, the cancer formation is facilitated. Co-carcinogens and hormones, they catalyze the oncogene induced uncontrolled cell proliferation and de-differentiation. Besides this, as we have already discussed, the withdrawal of the tumor suppressor genes affect induced altered growth factors and their receptors, alterations in the other key intracellular signaling path and decrease apoptosis and alteration in the telomerase, all these actually contribute to the formation of the cancer. Once the primary tumor has been developed, now the primary tumor has the potential or the property to release metalloproteinases and these metalloproteinases are actually responsible for the local invasion. Besides, there is also angiogenesis or formation of vascular channels and there is also metastasis and these lead to development of secondary tumors. So, understanding these are important because then the target of the different anti cancer drugs they can be understood. So, if angiogenesis is responsible for development of secondary tumors, if metastasis is important for development of secondary tumors and metastasis is happening through lymphatic spread or the hematogenous spread, one can think of one can try to target this angiogenesis or metastasis and try to arrest them and thereby think of having a, a benefit in cancer. Now, let us have some understanding about how the benign tumors, they, dif they are different from malignant tumors. So, when you talk of tumor, it could be either benign or malignant. Tumor is simply an abnormal growth with enlargement of tissue or organ. When you talk of benign tumors, there is a slow rate of cell division, there also cells are dividing faster than the uh, normal rate, but then definitely it is much slower as compared to the malignant tumors. Besides, there is lesser growth that means the tumor size is smaller as compared to malignant, there is no metastasis with in benign tumors. and they are not fatal, benign tumors are not fatal, non-fatal. In case of malignant tumors, where there is very fast rate of cell division, usually they metastasize, that means they spread to a distant organ, they are almost always fatal and the different types depending on what kind of tissue is affected, whether it is epithelial tissue or connective tissue, we call the malignant tumor as carcinoma or sarcoma. Carcinoma for epithelial tissue tumor malignancy and sarcoma for connective tissue malignancy. Besides, one can also think of solid tumors where the different solid organs they are affected whether it is liver, whether it is lung. So, they are called solid tumors whether it is uterus or ovary these are all solid tumors, but if the blood cells are affected in the bone marrow, we have leukemia. If the lymph lymphatic structures are affected, then we call lymphomas. The different causative factors are genes and epigenetic factors. Besides that, there are also the viruses, there are different chemical carcinogens and radiation and particularly sun rays direct sun, sunlight or direct sun ray irradiation 
can also cause certain kind of cancer, particularly skin cancer. Now, coming to the management of malignant tumors, the very broad principles are in any malignancy, it is said that because the cells grow in logarithmic scale, but until and unless it there has been a good number of cycles already occurred, there is no increase in or perceptible increase in the size of the tumor. So, by the time we can really appreciate, we can feel it can cause some symptoms, already there has been sufficient degree of proliferation or cell division has taken place. That means, it has progressed to a certain extent before even it can be symptomatic. So, it is very important thereby to find the or to detect cancer at the earliest as early as possible. And once we have detected it, we have to go for a total kill, total eradication of the cancer cells or cancer tissues. Because if even a single cell is left behind, that can again get into uh, multiple divisions, proliferation and again tumor development, recurrence will be there. So, far as their eradication is concerned, total kill is concerned, there are different modalities that are used for the treatment of malignancy. The age old one or the most primitive one was surgery, that is you just cut it out, resect it, resect the tumor. So, cut them, there is a strategy whereby we call burn them, burn the cancer cells by putting rays, radiotherapy and third is poison them, that is use chemical substances to kill them. So, poison them, fourth is tame them, if it is dependent on some hormonal factors or hormones, then accordingly modulate the hormone activity by using different drugs or also hormones and thereby tame them. And finally, we have the latest advances in, in using drugs for the treatment of cancer that is biologics, use of biologics. They are targeted therapies, they target the cancer cells better and they target deeper structures which is responsible for controlling cancer. So, biologics. So, cut them, burn them, poison them, tame them and target them well and deep. We have surgery, we have radiotherapy, we have chemotherapy, we have hormonal therapy and we have biologics. But in order to get optimum benefit, it is a, it is a common principle that as far as practicable, go for a multi-modality strategy. So, not just one modality would be enough you should try to use more than one or sometimes three modality also. Now, the principles also would include, it is our common experience and we can easily appreciate why most chemotherapy is most effective when the tumor is small. This is simply because when the tumor is small, a very high proportion of the cells in the tumor, they are actively dividing, the rate of division is very high. And as the rate of division is very high, they are most susceptible to the anti cancer drugs. Secondly, as the tumor is small, so the vasculature is also well protected. As the vasculature is well protected, the anti cancer drug can be well carried to all the cancer cells more correctly or more uh, efficiently rather than when the tumor has been big, large enough. So, towards the center of the tumor, some of the cells because they are not getting the nutrition enough, so they are dying and they are getting necrosed and there are patches of these necrosed areas which will otherwise hamper and impede the, the the distribution of anti cancer drugs through the circulation, because not all the parts of the tumor is continuing to receive circulation. Some of the areas which is dead and necrosed, 
they will not uh, they will not uh, be harboring the intact blood vessels which will be carrying the uh, the drug anti cancer drug so smaller the tumor the better it is to be successful with chemotherapy second is combination chemotherapy so almost always there are very few one or two exceptions but otherwise almost always the success of chemotherapy lies in using more than one drug simultaneously that is what is called combination chemotherapy simultaneous administration of multiple drugs that have cytotoxic or cell growth arresting potential the goal is to provide maximum cell kill with minimal or tolerable adverse experiences so when you when you use multiple drugs we see to it that they otherwise have different mechanisms of action so then only we can expect some additive effect or synergistic effect in achieving the treatment goal next is understanding about adjuvant chemotherapy or neo adjuvant chemotherapy adjuvant chemotherapy is the name very name suggests so the primary therapy is something else some other modality either it is surgery or it is radiotherapy and then in order to get best response you give chemotherapy so chemotherapy is actually following surgery or radiotherapy so after you have done, we have done surgery the tumor mass has been reduced so thereby the possibility of distribution of the anti cancer drug to uh, to the leftover or the residual portion of the tumor cells is increased and so now you give chemotherapy you, we can expect a better result that is what is called adjuvant chemotherapy it is adjuvant to primarily surgery or radiotherapy adjuvant to other modalities on the other hand when you talk of new adjuvant therapy which is also otherwise known as primary chemotherapy that means so chemotherapy is given first and this is followed by surgery or radiotherapy so that is also one strategy by giving chemotherapy you are if it is a huge tumor you are giving chemotherapy making it shrinking shrink so that it can be easily handled okay while surgery is done to increase accessibility and to have better uh, response or better outcome through surgery or through radiotherapy so first chemotherapy is given and then surgery or radiotherapy that is what is called neo adjuvant chemotherapy somebody may call it primary chemotherapy so primarily chemotherapy followed by other modalities now chemotherapy is given in cycles there is also logic why it is given in cycles so chemotherapy is given as we have discussed in combination so when you are giving combination chemotherapy multiple anti cancer drugs all these drugs are otherwise highly toxic and then when you are combining them it is possible if not toxicity getting synergized but then if the, if the most of the time it is seen that the toxicities are not not overlapping but then the they broaden the spectrum of the toxicities and as a result of which uh, and it is not just the tumor cells which are rapidly dividing some of the normal cells in our body they also divide at a faster rate as compared to other normal cells like if you think of the blood cells if you think of skin if you think of mucosa epithelial cells okay if you think of hair so all these cells the the uh, the reproductive cells all these cells they they divide quite fast rapidly as compared to other cells so when we are trying to target the cancer cells which are dividing at a very faster rate and we have said that the faster the rate of division the bit, the better they will be or the there is there are more chances that they will be killed better but what happens that some of the healthy cells which also normally or physiologically has a tendency to divide at a faster rate they will also be affected by these anti cancer drugs so the anti cancer drugs cannot differentiate between the healthy normal cells and the cancer cells so they will try to kill all cells that are dividing at a faster rate 
and those physiological those cells which are physiologically dividing at a faster rate as I just mentioned they will also be affected. As a result of which what happens after a cycle the cell count blood cell counts they drop and all types of cells they drop. The most sensitive is the neutrophils. So, there will be neutropenia. There could also be anemia and there is also possibility of platelet count going down. So, what should be done then? You have to wait after giving one cycle and then you wait for some time sufficient time so that all these cells they regain or sufficient number of that neutropenia is corrected. So, for correction of neutropenia one can think of depending upon the usual body system, but in order to facilitate that one can think of giving the factors stimulating factors colony stimulating factors from outside. Okay. Besides of course, there are other kinds of uh, adverse effects also and each cycle otherwise makes the patient quite sick and you should give sufficient time to the patient to recover so that he can withstand the uh, administration of the next cycle. But the timing is made in a manner that ultimately we can uh, with a few cycles we can try to achieve as much as possible towards the total cell kill. So, the rate of the growth of the uh, tumor cells, the growth kinetics and the rate at which the drug is being administered that is adjusted in a manner and usually it is in 3 weeks, every 3 weeks the cycles do happen and in between these 3 weeks we wait so that the normal physiological parameters or physiological markers they otherwise gain, regain their ability or regain their counts. Now, the different routes of administration are used for treating uh, for administering the different anti cancer drugs. The most commonly it is given is intravenous route, intravenous infusion along with fluids. The other routes are oral, there are some anti cancer drugs which can be given orally. Besides there is also topical application and sometimes intra cavitary or intra cavity within the tumor it can be injected and some of the some of the cavi cavities in the in our body where the um, where the malignant cells might be residing. Depending on this route of administration the necessary precautions are also to be taken particularly when we are giving intravenously we have to ensure that there is no extra vaccination because they are also otherwise many of the anti cancer drugs are very irritant and they can also cause local damage. Extra vaccination can finally, lead to uh, the uh, necrosis of the skin and uh, there can be ulceration etcetera. So, one should be cautious about that. Regarding the selection of the drugs in the uh, different combination regime that is based on their proven efficacy as a single agent in that given cancer, given uh, types of car carcinoma, they must have different mechanism of action and that only will justify their combining together and their toxicities must not overlap to a great extent. Preferably they should not uh, overlap at all. Anti-cancer chemotherapy sometimes can be given for prophylaxis also after the uh, optimum number of cycles are over when maximum benefit has been obtained, then we give uh, some anti cancer drugs for prophylaxis purpose okay, in order to prevent further recurrence. Now, we come to the uh, classification of anti cancer drugs and uh, broad groups are alkylating agents we have anti metabolites, we have certain antibiotics which are used uh, for treating cancer. Then we have a miscellaneous group, we have another group of drugs which is an enzyme inhibitor, topoisomerase 1 inhibitors and topoisomerase 2 blockers. 
then we have another group of drugs taxins and another plant alkaloid vinca alkaloids. So, these are the broad uh, seven groups of drugs. We can use a mnemonics to remember that is arm TV, A A A M, 3 A then M T V, A for alkylating agents, A for anti metabolites, A for antibiotics. We have put M in between that is miscellaneous, all the drugs which do not fit in these six groups they are put in the miscellaneous group. Next T for topoisomerase, 1 and 2 blockers and taxins and lastly vinca alkaloids. So, these are the different groups of drugs as which are used as uh, cancer chemotherapeutic drugs. So, this is I think what we were discussing in this session. So, the next session will be discussing about the uh, individual drugs. Just before that let us recapitulate the physiological basis of mechanism of action of the different drugs. This is how the uh, in a normal cell how the normal cell cycle they operate the different phase cell division that occurs. So, uh, if we start with the uh, there is a fast growth phase whereby the growth and normal metabolic uh, roles of the G 1 phase before G 1 there is a G 0 phase which is called a resting phase. So, G 1 phase is responsible for the faster growth or faster cell division, faster rate of cell division. There is an interphase or S phase or synthetic phase where which is responsible for DNA replication. Then there is a G 2 phase or growth and pre preparation for mitosis because after G 2 there will be mitosis. So, the cell needs to get prepared for the mit mitosis and this is the second growth phase. So, the first growth phase, synthetic phase, second growth phase. So, between the first and the second growth phase there is DNA replication phase. So, G 1 and G 2 in between there is synthetic phase or the this is also called the interphase or DNA replication phase and then there is a mitotic phase. In the mitotic phase again there are the different sub phases like prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase and then the cell may either go into a kind of rest that is G 0 and then it will again go into the fast growth phase. So, G 1 and G 2 in between these two there is S and after G 2 there is mitosis. So, the G 2 is preparation for mitosis and G 1 is the normal metabolic phase. So, after we understand this we can then think of the different drugs which otherwise act at the different uh, phase of the cell cycle. There are some drugs which are cell cycle non specific and there are some drugs which are cell cycle specific. Now, broadly speaking this is a kind of classification that again you see the analogy of the two uh, diagram that I am using that G 1 and G 2 in between the synthetic phase and then this mitotic phase is M phase. So, we have drugs like vinca alkaloids or other mitotic inhibitors which actually are influencing uh, the cell at the mitos mitosis phase. The alkylating, al alkylating agents and the taxoids they are acting at the G 1 phase, the anti metabolites at the synthetic phase and the G 2 phase also there are certain anti metabolites they act. So, this is broadly speaking how the different uh, drugs they act. So, with this uh, we will stop at this session and then another small session we will be having where the different drugs and their indications we will be discussing. Thank you very much. If there are questions we can discuss.